Before examining, you should wash your hands, introduce yourself and obtain consent. Patients are always examined from the right hand side of the bed and properly exposed. For the cardiology examination, the patient should be positioned at a 45 degree angle as this is the best position for examining the jugular venous pressure. Hello, Shlan. Hello. Um, my name is Dr. O'Malley. Hello, Doctor. Would it be okay if I examined you today? Sure, yes. Are you comfortable in that position? I am, thanks. And are you in any discomfort? No. First, general inspection is performed from the end of the bed. Note the patient looks well or unwell, the patient's breathing pattern, if there is cyanosis, note the patient's colour, and if there is any evidence of scars. The patient may appear breathless as a result of pulmonary edema. Cyanosis results in a bluish discoloration. If a patient is pale, this may be indicative of anemia, which can exacerbate heart failure or precipitate an ischemic event in those known to have cardiovascular disease. A midline stenotomy scar can be obvious as a result of a coronary artery bypass grafting operation or valve surgery. Look for a bulge indicating a pacemaker or ICD and for any equipment such as leads attached to a cardiac monitor, a catheter around the bed. I'm going to start with looking at your hands more closely. Okay. Would you mind putting your arms outstretched in front of you, please? The fingers are inspected for tobacco staining and peripheral cyanosis. On further inspection of the nails, look for splinter hemorrhages, which can be a sign of infective endocarditis. Look for clubbing. Clubbing is assessed by inspecting the, for loss of angle between the nail bed and the finger, and by checking for fluctuation. In order to check for fluctuation, place your thumbs under the distal part of the finger and using your index fingers, attempt to move the nail within the nail bed. The nail bed should feel spongy in the case of clubbing. Can you turn your hands over for me, please? The palm or creases should be inspected for evidence of pallor indicating anemia. Look for signs of infective endocarditis, which include ulcerative nodes, which are found on the pulps of fingers, the thenar and hypothenar eminences, and Jamie lesions, which are found on the palms or pulps of fingers. These are rare. You should now assess for the pulse. Before doing so, look for any skin or tendons anthemata on your way. These are yellow orange deposits of, of lipids in the tendons. That's great. Can you put your hands down by your side on the bed for me, please? I'm just going to check your pulse now, if that's OK. OK. Place three middle fingers over the radial artery. The most important features to examine here are the rate and rhythm. Count the pulse rate over 15 seconds and multiply by four. A rate of less than 60 beats per minute is called bradycardia, and a rate of greater than 100 beats per minute is called tachycardia. The rhythm will be regular if it is in sinus rhythm. An irregularly irregular pulse is usually due to atrial fibrillation. Do you have any pain in your shoulder? Now check for collapsing the pulse by feeling the pulse with your fingers and then raising the patient's hand above his or her head. It is found in aortic regurgitation. Then palpate both radial arches at the same time to look for any discrepancy in time or volume due to an atherosclerotic plaque or an aneurysm, for example. You should also check for radiofemoral delay. Note any delay or difference in pulse volume between the femoral radial artery which can be indicative of coarctation of the aorta. Use the index and middle finger to palpate the femoral artery. You should also listen for breeze over the femoral artery while there. Of note, if you have difficulty palpating the radial artery, move upwards to the brachial and crotch artery. Do you mind if I move down and check your blood pressure? No, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to place a cuff on your upper arm and it might be slightly tight for a few moments. Okay. Blood pressure is recorded as the systolic over diastolic pressure and it is measured in millimetres of mercury. 
The cuff is secured around the upper arm. The centre of the bladder should be over the brachial artery. Feel for the brachial pulse. The cuff should be inflated until you can no longer feel the pulse. At this point, note the pressure on the manometer, which gives a rough estimate. Then inflate the cuff another 30 millimetres of mercury. Now place the diaphragm of your stethoscope over the brachial artery. Slowly deflate the cuff and listen for the carotid cuff signs. The first sound correlates with systolic pressure, and the fifth sound prior to the disappearance of signs corresponds to the diastolic pressure. If signs do not disappear, the point of the muffling is best correlated with the diastolic pressure. A larger cuff size should be used for patients with an increased BMI. I'm now going to move on to examine your eyes. Can you look up and down for me, please? Look for evidence of xanthelasma or corneal orchids, which can be indicative of hyperdividemia. Look for evidence of, of conductive pallor, indicative of anemia. Dawnance may be present in the case of severe congestive of cardiac failure leading to hepatic congestion. Pallor of the skin should be noted, not already mentioned. Look for malarfatches, identified by a red blue tint over cheeks, which can be seen in severe mitrostenosis, for example. That's great. Okay. Can you open your mouth for me? Can you lift your tongue for me? The examiner will now decide if the patient has any evidence of cyanosis. Examine the mouth for evidence of a high arch palate, which is a, f a feature of Marfan syndrome, and for poor tooth hygiene, which can be a source for the development of infective endocarditis. So that's great, thank you. I'm now going to move on to examine your neck. Okay. Now I move on to examine the jugular venous pressure. Can you look to the left for me, slightly to the left for me, please? The JVP is the vertical height from the top of the venous pulsation to the sternal angle. The normal JVP should be 4 centimetres or less above the angle. It represents central venous and right atrial pressures in addition to indirectly refracting right ventricular pressure. Um, are you in any discomfort in your stomach? No. I'm now going to compress in your stomach for a few seconds. Is that okay? Okay. Perform the apatic jugular reflux. Gently press over the middle of the abdomen for 10 seconds. This will call, cause an increase in the venous return to the right side of the heart and should cause a temporary rise in the JVP. The elevation may take longer to decrease in contested cardiac failure. A rise in the JVP on inspiration is called the cosmal sign, which can be found, for example, in pericardial tamponade or constriction. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to examine the chest, if that's okay. Yeah. Are you in any discomfort? No. Look for surgical scars such as the midline sternotomy scar, if not already noted, for any chest deformities such as pectus, escavatum, which can be found in Martin syndrome, visible pulsations, look for a bulge of a pacemaker box or ICG, usually found below the left clavicle under the pectoral muscle, if not already noted. Now perform palpation of the precordium. I'm now going to move on to feel the chest, if that's okay. It's fine, yeah. Feel for the apex beat. In order to do so, count down the number of intercostal spaces. The second intercostal space lies just below the manubriosternal angle. The apex beat is defined as the most lateral and inferior position where the cardiac impulse can be felt. It is normally found in the fifth intercostal space at or medial to the midclavicular line. Ask the patient to roll on his or her left side if you have difficulty feeling it. The apex beat can be difficult to palpate in those who are overweight, who have a hyperinflated chest, or rarely in the case of dextrocardia. The apex beat can be displaced as a result of left ventricular dilatation, as seen in hypertension and aortic stenosis, for example. Now palpate for a right ventricular heave. A heave indicates right ventricular hypertrophy. Use the heel of your hand and place it onto the left parasternal region. Ask the patient to take a deep breath in and out and hold. Can you take a breath in, out and hold? Breathe normally. Thank you. Now feel for thrills or palpable murmurs. Feel at the apex, 
the left sternal edge and the base of the heart. I'm now going to listen to the chest. Yeah. Using your stethoscope, listen over the apex, the left lower sternal border, the upper right and left border. Listen with the bell first, then listen with the diaphragm. At each site, identify the first and the second heart sounds. Identify if there are any added sounds, such as an S3, which can be physiological or due to left ventricular failure, an S4, which can be heard in left ventricular hypertrophy and can be heard best at the apex using the bell, mechanical heart valves or pericardial rub. Listen for murmurs, which can result from increased flow or obstruction to flow through the valves. Murmurs are described according to the timing, i.e. whether they are systolic or diastolic. Feel for the carotid pulse with the thumb in order to time the murmur. If the murmur coincides with the carotid pulsation, it is systolic. It is also important to note the duration of the murmur, e.g. is it early, late or pansystolic. Note the position of the murmur, are you where it is heard best? Note that mitral regurgitation is heard best at the apex and aortic regurgitation at the left sternal edge, but systolic murmurs can be heard throughout different areas of the pyhordium. The grade and intensity of the murmur and whether it radiates should also be noticed. Now assess for murmurs in greater depth by performing dynamic manoeuvres. Listen in the auxilia with the diaphragm to detect the radiating murmur of mitral regurgitation. So listen at the apex, causing light pressure of the bell to check mid-diastolic and pre-systolic murmur of mitral stenosis. Listen over the right second intercostal space and over the left sternal angle with the diaphragm for the murmur of aortic regurgitation. Can you roll onto your left side for me, please? Thank you. They can rest back. Can you sit forward for me, please? Take a breath in and out for me. And hold. That's great, breathe normally. Sit back for me, please. Now listen for the radiating murmur of aortic stenosis and for carotid artery bruise. Can you take a breath in? and out and hold. Can you take a breath in and out and hold? Breathe normally. I'm now going to move on to examine the back of your chest. Okay. Would you mind sitting on the side of the bed for me? Yeah. Thank you. If it's okay with you, I'm going to tap and have a listen to your back. It's fine, yeah. Are you in any discomfort? No, I'm not. Now you should percuss and auscultate the lung bases. You should listen for any evidence of bibasal crepitation suggesting fluid overload or pulmonary edema. Can you breathe in and out through your mouth for me, please? You should also look for sacral edema with the use of two fingers. This is indicative of right ventricular failure. As part of your cardiovascular examination, you should look for hepatomegaly and ascites, which can be found in right ventricular failure, and splenomegaly, which can be a finding in infective endocarditis. Now move on to inspect the legs. Look for evidence of venous harvesting scars, which can be consistent with the previous cabbage operation. If present, the leg may be more swollen. Palpate for pitting edema. I'm going to move on to have a look at your legs. Okay. 
Are you in any discomfort? No. Palpate the distal shaft of the tibia by compressing with your fingers and thumb for 15 seconds. If edema is noted, identify the upper level. Right ventricular failure or biventricular failure can cause bilateral pitting edema. Of note, you should palpate the peripheral pulses and look for features of peripheral vascular disease as part of your cardiovascular examination.